You are listening to Over and Back's Basketball Mysteries of the 1970s. Today's mystery is how many teams were added, subtracted, moved, or changed their names? All right, welcome back. I am Jason. With me as usual is Rich, and we are getting into another mystery today. Uh, quite a confounding mystery with a lot of uh, numbers, but we're going to break it down for everyone and try to unravel this whole expansion, creation of new league, moving cities, uh, teams folding, all, all that kind of good stuff. We're going to go through it all and try to make it as simple as possible for people to understand yeah, there's going to be a lot of numbers being thrown around because, uh, believe it or not, it was not a stable time in the 1970s. So, yeah, just try to try to bear with us. But, yeah, it's it's a mess. Yeah. It is. This might be our biggest, like, mystery doc that we've done. Just just has the most lines, the most stuff, just because there's just so much movement yes. going on every single year, you know, multiple times a year, multiple teams. It, it's just it's not. But I think it's going to all add up to something interesting. So so between 1967 and 1981, there were 22 neat, new teams created, uh, 10 of them for the NBA and 12 of them for the ABA. 19 of those teams were between 61 and 71 so all but three were, were between that period of time so so that was obviously the major portion but it's interesting to include the other ones as well uh 1967 the chicago bulls joined the nba simple enough mm-hmm. 68 things get a little crazy we, the nba gets the san diego rockets and the seattle supersonics and in the aba we get the anaheim amigos new orleans buccaneers new jersey americans who would later become the nets pittsburgh pirates dallas chaparrales who would become the spurs later minnesota muskies Denver Rockets, who would become the Nuggets, Indiana Pacers, Houston Mavericks, Kentucky Colonels, and Oakland Oaks. So simple enough, new league. So now there's two leagues with um, uh, two leagues competing against each other. Uh, 1969, the next year, we had two more NBA teams, the Phoenix Suns, the Milwaukee Bucks. In 71, so we skip a year, we uh, get the Portland Trail Blazers, Los Angeles Clippers, Cleveland Cavaliers, and there was going to be a fourth Houston franchise added to the NBA, but there were not enough money from the financial backers, so that did, that fell through, but then San Diego went, ended up moving to Houston, so everything was good. And then to round things up, 1973, the ABA adds a team, the San Diego Conquistadors, who are also known as the Qs. 1975, we get the New Orleans Jazz, and 1981, we end this period of expansion with the Dallas Mavericks. There we go. Unfortunately, uh, 21 teams changed cities <laughs> between 1968 and 1980, so it's going to get very wild here. Uh, try to bear with me, but every year, especially in particularly in the ABA, uh, it moves around a lot. So 1969, which if you're staying, you know, keeping track at home, that's the second year of the ABA. A lot of movement going on. Anaheim Amigos, they become the Los Angeles Stars. The Minnesota Muskies, uh, they move down south. They become Miami Floridians. The Pittsburgh Pipers become the Minnesota Pipers. And the New Jersey Americans, as you mentioned, become the New York Nets. 1970, again, ABA, the Oakland Oaks become the Washington Capitals, the Houston Mavericks become the Carolina Cougars, the Minnesota Pipers, yes, they just moved last year, they go back to the Pittsburgh Pipers, so everything is well and good in Pittsburgh. 1971, the New Orleans Buccaneers become the Memphis Pros, uh, the Washington Capitals become the Virginia Squires, yes, the Washington Capitals just moved last year, or changed names last year, but they did it again, and the LA Stars, who uh, originally were the Anaheim Amigos, da, 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 they become the Utah Stars. 1972, the San Francisco Warriors become the Golden State Warriors, so the NBA is doing, uh, doing a little bit of their own movement, uh, and the San Diego Rockets become the Houston Rockets. Uh, 1973, the Cincinnati Royals become the Kansas City Omaha Kings, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, later. Uh, 1974, the Dallas Chaparrales become the San Antonio Spurs, and the Baltimore Bullets become the Capital Bullets. Uh, 1975, Carolina Cougars, they become the Spirits of St. Louis. 1976, the Memphis Sounds become the Baltimore Claws. Uh, they fold before the season begins, though, so the Baltimore Claws do not play. Uh, and then the Kansas City Oklahoma the Kings, they settle in Kansas City, uh, stripping off the uh, Omaha part of them. Uh, then 1978, the New York Nets, they become the New Jersey Nets. 1979, the Buffalo Braves become the San Diego Clippers. 1980, the New Orleans Jazz become the Utah Jazz. So, deep breath, several cities had two attempts at teams, uh, but only one, San Diego, had three. They got three tries. They got the Rockets, uh, the Qs, as you mentioned before, slash the Sales. They become the Sales later, and then uh, eventually the Clippers. So they got three chances at the wheel, and... Uh, as we know, San Diego became a haven for great basketball stability from there on out. So Absolutely. <laughs> right. uh, today, even today, even today, still, even today, with Bill Walton as their uh, principal owner, they are. <laughs> right, and Steve Kerr's the coach, right? you know, it's San Diego. Guys. Right, exactly. yeah, so. right, right, right. So, um, so nine teams changed their nicknames between 68 and uh, 76 without moving. In 71, the Miami Floridians become just the Floridians. Uh, the Pittsburgh Pipers became the Pittsburgh Condors. The Dallas Chaparrales became the Texas Chaparrales. They did. They started to play a few more uh, games in Fort Worth, but they did not. They were still in Dallas. 72, the Texas Chaparrales say, hey, we want to go back to being the Dallas Chaparrales. 
73, the Memphis Pros become the Memphis Tams. They are owned, this is when they were picked up by uh, Charlie Finley, the eccentric baseball owner. And Tam stood for Tennessee, Alabama, Minnesota, or excuse me, Mississippi. <laughs> Minnesota would, I would not have worked out. That I like way. how they stretch. I like their, they stretch their demographics. Yeah. So, you know, you got, you got all those states. And then, you know, we also have Minnesota. So that's not Some bad. Like, we long could've... road trips there. Um, <laughs> we skip a year of the 75. The Memphis Tams become Memphis Sounds. Uh, the Denver Rockets become the Denver Nuggets. The Capitol Bullets become the Washington Bullets. And then in 76, the San Diego Qs become the San Diego Sales, but only last 11 games as the Sales before the team folds. Oh, San Diego. Speaking of folding, eight teams folded in this era. The uh, 1972, the Floridians and the Condors folded. 1976, the Baltimore Claws, as we mentioned before, before the season, so they didn't even play. Uh, San Diego Sales, they had 11 games before they folded. And then the Utah Stars uh, leading it with uh, 16 games before they folded. Uh, the Virginia Squires, uh, they folded one month before the ABA and NBA merger. Uh, the Kentucky Colonels, uh, they have some interesting stories with John Y. Brown that we'll talk about in a future episode. And then the Spirits of St. Louis, which are a very famous team that folded and got a sweetheart deal. Uh, from the NBA in the merger the ABA you know they, they decided we are not gonna you know, we will fold our team we will not you know grab a team in the NBA that's fine we don't care we just want you know a little bit percentage of this TV money in perpetuity and they went oh yeah whatever and as you know it's a famous story that comes up every year that these guys just get a massive NBA check uh, just for you know what they did with the spirits of St. Louis and then and, and not, you know, folding like, you know, the Virginia Squires did a month prior. Cause uh, so it's, it's a super interesting story, which I'm sure we'll get to uh, at some point later in this uh, series as well. But yeah, those are your teams that folded. Yes. So that all equals 60 major franchise changes in 14 years, which is pretty amazing to think about. I mean, <laughs> imagine if for the last 14 years, if something like that had happened in the NBA and when we've had like, probably three teams move in the last 14 years in the NBA and a, and a couple of nickname changes. Right. It, it's just, it's staggering how many yeah, 60 is just insane. Yeah. So I mean, for the league to, uh, you know, for the basketball landscape to more than double in size for all these things to happen, it's just, um, you, you, it's one thing to know when it's all like laid out like that, it's pretty amazing. So, Another thing that happened was uh, teams would end up playing in an awful lot of cities. Um, so uh, there was there were the regional franchises, the uh, the Virginia Squires and the um, the Carolina Cougars that we'll get to in, in a little bit later that uh, were formally played in multiple cities. But a lot of the uh, teams would, you know, even if they didn't officially move, they would they would play uh, quite a few games in um, in different seasons. So that'd be interesting to kind of look a little bit about, about that. The Pacers pretty much stuck with Indianapolis, so they would occasionally play a handful of games in Fort Wayne, but their travel wasn't too bad. Kentucky Colonels, they were mainly in Louisville, but in the mid seventies, they played a good bit in Cincinnati and Lexington, actually close to one quarter of their home games. And they came very close to moving to Cincinnati before, uh, John Y. Brown's son, um, um, didn't want them to move the team and wanted him to um, I, I think it might have actually been before he bought the team was to they, they want to keep the colonels in um, in uh, Louisville so they um, so Joe Brown worked out a deal to keep the team there and was a hometown here at least for a while uh, Rockets and Nuggets they played 99% of their home games in Denver so that wasn't a big problem uh, the Chaparros and Spurs where they started in Dallas um they did play quite a bit in uh, Fort Worth, particularly that one year where they were the Texas Chaparrals, and uh, then, of course, moved to San Antonio and, and stayed in San Antonio when they were the Spurs. Didn't really have to travel a whole lot. So we interrupt this great podcast that you're listening to. My name is Kevin Rayfuse. I'm Tim Tompkins. And I'm Justin Kuzart. And we host the Drive and Dish NBA podcast. We cover every team in the league and a bunch of really fun segments like random NBA player, drive and Dougal, and hot takes from Reddit. So when you're done listening to this podcast, give us a search on iTunes or whatever podcast streaming app you're listening on. We're also at driveanddishpodcast.com. We are the Drive and Dish NBA podcast. The Americans and Nets, well, it's... <laughs> Strep in, by the way. It's a little bit complicated. Put the seatbelt on. This one's going to get wild. So, so, in 1968, they played in the Teaneck Armory in Teaneck, New Jersey, uh, which was built in 1936. It was a National Guard ar armory. And they, um, on March 23rd, 1968... The Americans and the Colonels were tied, and they decided to play a, a play-in game to determine who would qualify for the playoffs. And it was going to be played at the T-Neck Armory, but that was booked for the circus. So they decided they would play at the Comac Arena nearby, but they found the court full of holes and uh, basically unplayable. The Colonels refused to take the court under those conditions, and then the commissioner ruled that the Americans had to forfeit the game because they didn't have acceptable facilities. 
Uh, the kicker is they ended up moving to the Comac Arena the next season and playing there. <laughs> my favorite part of the entire story. Then, um, like, this is ridiculous. We are going to move here full time. This is great. Thank you. We cannot wait. And then in 70 and 71, they ended up moving to the Island Garden in West Hempstead, New York, which was not much better. And the Nets were unable to play any home playoff games in 71 because the arena was booked with other events. Uh, 72, they started in the Island Garden again, but they spent the last two months in Nassau Coliseum, which was finally built in Uniondale, New York, which was a nice facility. Uh, they stayed there for, through until uh, 77. In 71 72, they did play a few games in Madison Square Garden. Um, uh, so they they got a few dates there, but but uh, yeah, obviously those were special attraction type games. Uh, then once they merged with the uh, NBA, they had to move to New Jersey, so they went to the Rutgers Athletic Center in Piscataway, um, New Jersey, which is quite uh, a far away. I'll try to give some sense of this in just a moment. Um, for the rest of their history, they played in the uh, the Brendan Byrne Arena from eighty two to two thousand and ten, which is in East Rutherford. Then they played two years in the Prudential Center in Newark, and then now of course are in the Barclays Center for Brooklyn. If you were to drive from the from the the, the first arena from the um uh from the uh the Teaneck Armory to the Barclays Center uh, and you went to every arena on their stop it would take you a four hour and 54 minute round trip to, uh, to <laughs> do so so it, it is all except for the Piscataway you know the, um New Jersey these are all actually roughly geographically they're fairly close now of course you know there's a very the long island arena is pretty out there uh, that's one that a little, out. yeah that one's a little it's not bad yeah, but it's not that far from nassau you know but it, yes it, that is that's the furthest east point the furthest west point by far is the Rutgers athletic center so the other ones are fairly you know um you know not that far geographically but of course you know the the, the travel that it required in that area in new york city and and, and those areas are, are quite substantial so um uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll try to tweet out the map when we have the show um uh, so people can see the uh, the the I, I did a very deep investigation of google maps so. <laughs> <laughs> thank god i'm glad you did yes. thank you so uh the muskies and floridians uh, they of course started in minneapolis then they moved to miami beach and they also played in various florida cities jacksonville tampa west palm beach st petersburg probably one third or so of their uh, schedule so they they were not necessarily original franchise in name but they were definitely were one in action i guess they did change that year to the floridians to kind of give themselves a more of a florida feel uh the amigos and the stars um they, they stuck pretty much in anaheim when they were there they did play a handful of california cities then they they did stick with los angeles and salt lake city when they were in those places probably 98 percent of their games in in salt lake city um the the oaks cap squires franchise the um o oakland they did play uh, a handful of california cities actually a lot of the same ones the amigos played in as well that was interesting that those sort they sort of um shared some cities uh, during the time in which they were around of course the amigos only around for one year uh the then when they moved to washington they were in the uline arena which i thought was interesting in washington dc which is where the original um nba capitals played the red arbot coached uh, capitals in the late right, 40s. which was many years uh, after yes. <laughs> or many years before this Right. So probably not the best facility. No, point, it, it was they, their stories and loose balls about like people being scared to go to the arena because it was such a dangerous part of town. Right. Uh, the uh, and uh, then they moved, of course, to Virginia. And um, then they, they basically shared three cities, uh, Norfolk, Hampton and Richmond. They, they did occasionally have a, a few games there, but they basically Norfolk was was te technically their home place. But, um, you know, there is some you know reasoning between you know, having a regional franchise if you're not in a big population center because obviously theoretically you can draw from other areas in the state but in practice your operating costs are a lot higher and um and you also are sort of seen as carpet baggers by you know the other cities so you don't really you know it, obviously that situation didn't really work out for any of the teams that really tried it yeah, it's hard to get like pride for your team when it's kind of bouncing every, you know what I mean? Like there's not a home base to it. And especially when you're going to, you know, different cities within a state, a lot of times you do have, you know, cities don't really necessarily like identify with those other cities. You know, one, one city identifies with their city. They don't identify as, you know, the whole state. A lot of times you get city pride more so than state pride or regional pride. So it uh, definitely becomes an issue. And the, the Bucks pros, Tam sounds clause franchise. They played when they were in New Orleans, they played about 15% of their games elsewhere, mostly in Memphis. Probably they were scouting out memphis to, uh, upon a move and then when they were in memphis they would play some games in nashville some in jackson tennessee some in jackson mississippi uh but they gave that up uh, off the uh, couple of seasons and basically stuck mm -hmm. with um 
and, and basically you stuck with Memphis the rest of the way. The uh, Piper's Condors franchise um, basically stuck with Pittsburgh when they were in Pittsburgh. When they were in Minneapolis, they played about 20 percent of their games in, in Duluth. Uh, the Mavericks Cougar Spirits franchise in Houston, they actually played all their games in Houston. Uh, when they moved to Carolina, they they again had the regional franchise um, uh, aspect. They played ni- for 71, for example, they played 19 games in Greensboro, uh, 12 games in Raleigh, and 12 games in Charlotte. So most of them in Greensboro, which was technically their home, but and where they drew the best. The other cities they did not draw particularly well, especially Charlotte, which is funny because, of course, they that's a bigger city and has the NBA team now. And then in St. Louis, they played all of their games, all their home games in St. Louis, except for one in Salt Lake City late in 1976 when there were rumors that the team had planned to move there, which, of course, did not happen because the league folded. And then lastly, the San Diego, um, the Conquistador Sales, they played all their games in San Diego. There we go. So they they were the one stability, (laughs) stable factor in all this is the cookie stores and the sales. So uh, that's great. Uh, And then so we were mentioning a little bit about it, but, uh, you know, teams that tried the regional franchise uh, approach of of being a truly, yeah, in the NBA of being a truly regional franchise. And the Kansas City Omaha Kings, they're your number one, you know, they're the kind of the standard bearer for that. Uh, They shared both cities from uh, 1973 to 75 uh, and then uh, 15 games in Omaha in 1973 to kind of kick it off. Uh, as far as when they began, you know, or what, when, when it was kind of decided, let's do this regional franchise thing. Uh, the, you know, 1969, the Royals owner, uh, Louis Jacobs, he turned over the operations to his son, Max Jacobs. Well, Max, he brought in uh, Joe Axelson, who was a Kansas City businessman, as you can see, hint, hint, as their general manager. And then soon after, believe it or not, shockingly, they decided that Cincinnati was not a very good basketball area and they had to move. So uh, not, uh, you know, there's some there's some tinges of the OKC uh, Seattle Supersonics thing there as well, but. Uh, uh, yeah, so before the start of the 1971-72 season, uh, 10, 10 Kansas City businessmen, including Axelson, uh, bought the Royals for $5 million, and then that, of course, was the club's last season in Cincinnati. Uh, Axelson then, uh, in May uh, 1972, he had a quote in a uh, uh, newspaper. He said, this is definitely a two-city franchise. Actually, Omaha is the proven NBA city. Kansas City is the chance city in this arrangement. So very, very interesting. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know, but uh, Omaha was a, bear, uh, a much better venue uh, between the two cities. Um, they put 40 games at the Civic and it produced a 27 and 13 record uh, for the kind of the Omaha part of that franchise. And they were not uh, a nice good team. So that's uh, no, no, yeah. no, not at all. Uh, 72, 73. It's the franchise's uh, first season as, as kind of the Kansas City Omaha Kings. Uh, Axelson, he was named again the uh, NBA Executive of the Year. And then, as you mentioned, even though his club was thirty six and forty six and didn't make the playoffs, they were kind of seen as as a, a successful franchise, and he as a successful uh, you know executive. So uh, again, nineteen seventy three, seventy four. They the uh, KC uh, Omaha team. They're thirty three and forty nine. They missed the playoffs again. Uh, they improved to forty four and thirty eight and finished second in the Midwest in seventy four, seventy five. Uh, that team led by first team all nba guard nate tiny archibald uh they lost to the chicago bulls in six games in the western conference semifinals and then this uh was the last year of the omaha tag although the team continued to play a few games in omaha here and there they became officially the kansas city kings after that yes. so yeah and, uh, and it, it's interesting because a similar dynamic would play out um upon their move in 85 to sacramento and axelson would actually be brought back he was away from the team for a few years and he was brought back and basically put into the same role of you know, trying to kind of keep the game, team together but then at a certain point they realized they were gonna have to move to sacramento and then he was sort of the fall guy for that situation even though it wasn't really necessarily his fault but it's interesting that that dynamic played out you know roughly 12 years later Right. Uh, other NBA teams, the Houston Rockets, uh, they played a lot of games in other cities, mostly San Antonio. Uh, the Milwaukee Bucks, they played some games in Madison, Wisconsin, the uh, state's capital. And then the Buffalo Braves, they played some games in Toronto as well, but they stayed relatively, uh, at least for the most part, they, they stayed relatively kind of stable uh, in that area for the most of the NBA. Yeah, I didn't so. really notice any other, you know, situations where teams were you know, playing significant um, number of cities outside of the NBA. It was, it was mostly an ABA thing with those exceptions. Um, so, so, so I also wanted to look at which players bounced around the most. Um, there's some pretty fascinating looks and these are not (laughs) absolutely, you know, there, there may be players who may have bounced around a little bit more, but these are some of the name players who, um, just had, you know, quite amazing careers when you think about it. Um, Tom Owens, who was a good center. He was, um, he's in the breaks of the game book. He's written about there. He kind of is the replacement for Bill Walton and he bounced around the league quite a bit. Um, 
He started, uh, he, he basically played for eight teams between 72 and 83 with 11 moves in total. He played for, he played for Memphis, he played for Carolina, he played for the Spirits, he played for uh, Memphis again, he played for Kentucky, he played for the Pacers, he played for the Spurs, he played for the Rockets. Actually, he ended up four years with the uh, Trailblazers. That was this one uh, stable spot. Um, he did play a couple uh, years in Carolina and then finished his career with Indiana and Detroit. So, um, bounced around quite a bit. Mal Calvin, who was a five-time All-Star, he played for nine teams from 70 to 81, including half of the of the ABA franchises. Uh, Steve J- Snapper Jones, who is, of course, became a, a famous broadcaster afterward. He's a, a, a big source of the um, of loose balls. He talks a lot about the league, and you know, it was, it was a great history resource for the league. But he played in. Um, um, he played for quite a few franchises as well. He played for um, Oakland and the New Orleans, uh, the Pros, um, Dallas, Carolina, um, Denver, the Spirits. And then finally, his last year in 76, he played for the uh, Trailblazers. And um, M- Manny Leakes is interesting. Uh, he played um, – he is only one of two players I can find who played at least 20 games with three separate teams in one season. The other is Reggie Johnson, who did in the NBA from 81 to uh, 82. And he, he bounced around quite a bit as well for um, for the, the the three seasons he played with – that season we played uh, 31 games with the Colonels, 20 games with the New York Americans, and uh, 27 games with the um, with the Dallas Shepherds. So, and then Warren Jabali, who we've talked a little, about, a little bit about before, and he played. Um, he only played seven seasons, but he played uh, with six teams during that time. Even though he's an extremely talented player, he was a four-time <laughs> All-Star. He uh, well, had a little bit of issues with getting along with others or people getting along with him, and uh, he ended up being out of the league after seventy-five after suffering a pretty serious knee in- injury. So uh, it just kind of gives you sort of a sense of like what these guys were dealing with as far as the instability of you know not only being traded but just having to you know move um, from team to team, and even if you were playing with a stable team you know a lot of the times especially in the aba you were going to have to play in quite a few different cities you know whether it was road trips or you know if you if you were playing for one of those regional franchises that had three cities sure. you, you can imagine how difficult that life must have been and, and player movement is just insane as well especially particularly in the aba because you have teams so often that are doing you know hey take this guy if you give me cash like i need cash tomorrow or you know like just weird crazy stuff where guys are just getting moved guys that really you know throughout loose balls you'll hear stories of these guys that are really good and, the, and their gms will say he's really good but i needed money you're like we had to make payroll this week so we had to like send that guy like just insane stuff that's just so unfathomable today in today's nba with contracts and and just the fact that players aren't just seen as 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 that level of commodity that they were uh, in the 70s where it was just like you know and and just the stability of these aba teams and not being able to make payroll and finances and all that sort of stuff made for just a crazy player moving crazy team moving crazy everything so yeah absolutely so uh thanks everyone for checking us out you can find us at harborparoxysm.com we hope you've been enjoying our basketball mystery to the 70s series uh if you like what you've been hearing please leave us a rating and review on um itunes or stitcher or wherever you listen to your podcast you can find us on twitter and facebook at over and back nba uh thanks for listening and until next time uh, we'll see you again soon next time on basketball mysteries of the 1970s about how you know, he's trying to negotiate a contract with Charlie Finley and then he's going in, uh, you know, they're supposed to have lunch together and he's going in and like Charlie Finley's like heating up the soup and is like this hot plate and he's like, oh, you know, he must not have, you know, have very much with, you know, if, if he's having to deal with this. So he ended up accepting a lesser amount, finding out later that was just sort of a trick that Finley liked to do to, you know, <laughs> not, not pay him.